Hi, everyone. Um, good morning. My name is Justin Chen. Uh, I'm the founder of the Boston Uni University uh, Machine Intelligence Community, um, CEO, founder, and director of Machine Intelligence Community, Inc., um, along with my board of directors, uh, Jay Jane, uh, Jacqueline Zhu, and Professor Kate Sanko. Um, I think they're still sleeping. Um, but anyways, uh, welcome to our inaugural Machine Intelligence Conference, uh, also abbreviated MIC, optimistically to enhance our brand's value and unpragmatically to confuse people in conversation. Um, the thesis of our conference originally stemmed from the idea of demonstrating the value that could be achieved when students uh, who are passionate about machine intelligence unite as a larger, um, more inclusive, and cognitively diverse community. Uh, our conference serves as an even greater surface area for intellectual engagement um, for students outside the classroom and beyond boundaries of individual institutions. Uh, it is our mission and hope um, that the Machine Intelligence Conference will empower students to take uh, agency over the trajectory of their education, promote diversity that will fundamentally change the paradigm of our field, and catalyze connections to accelerate progress in research and engineering uh, to burgeon uh, great ideas as a single machine intelligence community. Um, throughout the day, there will be technical talks by invited students um, here in the multipurpose room across the hall in Silverman Skyline. Um, there will also be a series of technical talks by invited industry uh, researchers and engineers in the lecture hall. Um, I'd like to thank Malang, Intel AI, NVIDIA, Facebook, Charles River Analytics, Amazon, and Red Hat for their generous support. Uh, I would also like to highlight our, our conference code of conduct, which you can find on our website, um, that we expect like all people here to uh, adhere to. Um, and you can find that at the bottom of the conference webpage. Uh, and so we have two opening keynote speakers, uh, one industry and one researcher. Um, our first is Matt Scott. Uh, he's the founder and CTO of Malong Technologies, which leads computer vision technologies uh, for the retail and medical industries. He has more than 15 years of R&D experience in computer vision and machine learning. He's a senior member of the IEEE and published over 70 patents and over a dozen research papers in top scientific conferences and journals and featured articles in proceedings for IEEE. Uh, at CPPR in 2017, Matt and his team won first place in the Web Vision Challenge, um, a worldwide computer vision contest by Google. Uh, but the most important of all his admiral accolades uh, is that, like myself, Matt is a BU Terrier. Um, I think that's probably a highlight right there. Uh, and our uh, research uh, opening keynote is Leslie Kilbling. Um, and so she is a professor of the practice at MIT where she indoctrinates uh, young and malleable minds with the universal truths of machine learning in course 6036. Uh, Leslie's agenda is to make intelligent robots using methods including estimation, learning, planning, and reasoning, and to keep Elon Musk up at night. Um, she was the founding editor-in-chief of the Journal of Machine Learning Research. Uh, according to Google Scholar, she has been cited over 24,000 times. Um, so please join me in warmly welcoming both our speakers. So hi, I'm Leslie Kelbling. Uh, I am a professor here, so probably some of you have seen me for too many hours in the morning. Um, I uh, also didn't do the thing I was supposed to do. So I'm supposed to have a talk about the future of AI, and we can sort of often talk about AI and economics and business and culture and that's really cool. But I am just like a hopeless geek and so I'm just gonna talk about hopelessly geeky stuff. Oh, do I, do I need this? I need this? Oh, heck, okay. Uh, good, okay. So um, I was just at a conference last week in Zurich called the Conference on R Robot Learning. So my goal in life is to make intelligent robots. General purpose intelligence, I'm not interested in any applications or things being useful. I wanna understand intelligence and I do that by trying to understand how to make robots that can behave effectively in the world. Okay, so here's the story. If you think about a robot, a robot is a thing that, uh, and, and I have a very broad definition of robot, so it probably includes you and the operations of United Airlines and just any kind of system, really, that interacts with an environment around it, and you can think of it as something that takes actions that change the state of the environment and makes observations that give us information about the environment that it lives in. Um, so that's a transducer. And our job, I'm gonna include you with me, so our job as, as robot, I think of myself as a robot engineer in a sense, our job as robot engineers is to find a policy, a program that goes in the head of the robot. And what that program is supposed to do is to take the whole history of observations and actions that it's ever made and decide what action to take next. 
So no matter your religion about AI, whether you think it needs to be a neural network or a theorem prover or something I wrote or something that got evolved, whatever, you, whatever it is, in the end, that's what has to be in the head of the robot. And our job is to figure out how to find good pies to put in the heads of robots. Okay, so uh, one way to think about this, okay, so here's, here's the problem. So here's the robot factory, right? So I wanna think about, actually, the, fa the robot factory. So, so the robot factory is where we do whatever work it is that we need to do to make the program that goes in the head of the robot. And if we have a robot factory, generally speaking, we're gonna have to emit like copies of the same robot, copies of the same software. But, th so then we have to ask the question, well, what, what, what would make a good program to put in the heads of the robots that I'm making? And one way to think about that is to think about the whole distribution of environments that my robots are gonna have to go into, right? So if I'm selling robots, so I'm the Acme robot factory, and I'm delivering robots with some program in their head, people are gonna take them home, and they're gonna take them home to all different kinds of homes, and whatever program I put in the head of the robot is gonna have to work in all those places. And so, what kind of a program should that be? Well, it's probably gonna have to do something that feels like learning, right? Because it's gonna have to go to my house and figure out how to behave well in my house and go to your house and figure out how to behave well in your house, right? So part of the reason I, I'm gonna spend a little time on this methodological point because people argue like, oh, well, should the robot do learning or should it not do learning? And the answer is that there's no need to have a debate. The program that needs to be in the head of the robot is the program that will work best in expectation over all the places where we think it might get put. So our problem is to find a pie that works well in expectation over the environments it's gonna get put in. So if it's a factory robot, we can build a lot of information into it in advance because there's not very much variation in the world it's gonna have to live in. If it's a household robot that's just supposed to be your general purpose helper, then it has to be able to adapt to a very wide range of environments. And probably we, the robot engineers, need to build in less, and the robot's gonna have to figure out more about what it's supposed to do once it's out in its niche and understanding what to do in the world. So this is a way to think about the problem. Okay, so, so all right, so my job now is not so much anymore to, to it, it's, it's to design this robot factory, right? So I'm gonna have to figure out how is it, what's the methodology that I can use to make robots that are gonna work well in a certain distribution of environments? How can I think about that? Well, one strategy, right, is reverse engineer humans, right? So, and a lot of people when they talk about AI, they say, oh, well, what AI is is somehow making computer programs that work like humans do. And that is a very interesting enterprise, and it is a way to try to make AI, right? Because I think many of us believe that, well, whatever's going on in a human brain is a, it's a physical process, and if we could understand it well enough and simulate that, then that would be a way to make actually really interestingly intelligent systems. And I think that that's true, but to me, right, it, for me personally, it's, it's too hard. I don't know how to make progress in that direction. It's also true that it would maybe help us make robots that live in the same niche that humans do, but it might not help us make robots that occupy a different distribution of, of problem domains. Okay, so what's another strategy? Another strategy is to say, well, never mind all that stuff, just like write the program. You know, Pi is a program, we're all software engineers. Uh, we could just sit in our chair and write down the program that we need and that will do the job. Okay, but that hasn't worked, right? So for a long time, people tried to, for instance, sit at their terminals and write a program to do face detection, and that didn't work. Face detection didn't work at all. Lots of smart people worked really hard on it. It didn't work until people started using learning to do that. Right. So we don't really know how to just sit and write that program. Okay, so what's another strategy? Well, you could say that well, whoever it is that put the program in our heads that we're born with when we start, uh, think of that as evolution, right? So there was a long process of trial and error, and eventually that process of trial and error put the right program in our heads, and that puts, makes us able to do the thing we're able to do. So let's explore that a little bit. It's, it makes me nervous. It seems like it took evolution a long time, but let's think about that. So let's imagine that we're gonna make a, like a, a robot factory that kind of does evolution or, so, or some kind of learning, right? 
So recall that our problem still is to make a program that's going to work well in this whole distribution of environments. So now, in some sense, what we need to do is, in our robot factory, we need a microcosm of the world that our robots are going to have to go out into, right? So that's how evolution works, right? Evolution gets, gets to have a lot of tries of a lots of different programs in, in lots of different environments drawn from the relevant environment distribution. And it gets to try out different programs in different worlds and see which one works. Um, well, OK, so that's a search problem. And it's totally well formed. And uh, uh, you can think of it as, as just you know many of you have studied search algorithms in various ways. You can say, OK, well, I just need to search over the space of programs in some way and evaluate how well they work in the world. And so one way to think about this, and uh, partly I should say that you know I, this is a, a basically the, the talk I gave at this robot conference. And the current like cool thing to do in robot learning and in, in much of learning, although probably not anything that actually works in the world, but in the kind of the, the, the academic learning people like to talk about doing end-to-end -end learning, right? So I just I take inputs and I generate outputs. And I want to do no harm, right? So first do no harm, this is supposed to be some part of the doctor's oath. So the worry, people worry that by building something into the program in advance, they might doom their robot to some kind of suboptimality or stupidity. Because right? if I build something in, I, the engineer, I might be wrong. It might have been a poor choice. I might have picked a modularity that was like stupid and will prevent the robot from learning the perfect thing. OK, so if that's uh, what I want to do, I would argue, this is like the most general possible algorithm, which also I don't think is very smart. But anyway, the most general possible algorithm is something like enumerate all possible programs from the simplest to the most complicated, try them all out in all the worlds, and see how they work. And if anybody asks you, just return the best thing you've found so far. OK, so that's an algorithm. And it's totally an algorithm for AI. And so we could just all go home, right? That's an algorithm for inventing AI. But it might take a long time, right? And it's also, you know, it's, it's not going to have any built-in, any biases built in by the engineers. So it's like a, it's an awesome algorithm. But except for maybe the runtime. So as I see it, we sort of have two choices, right? Oh, so one choice, one choice, maybe it's an attractive choice, which is just like, OK, to set that thing up. And then for several generations, just go to the beach and read novels and whatever. And then eventually, we'll have intelligent robots. They will evolve on, in this process. OK, but I am like not, I, I, maybe I should go to the beach, but somehow that's not my temperament. So I want to work on it. And so I'm going to work on this problem, but I'm going to actually try to combine a bunch of things that we know in order to get a, a kind of something that might work in the shorter term. So what I want to do is do some kind of machine learning in the factory, right? So when I design a robot, I'm going to do some machine learning work, some evolutionary learning or some gradient descent type learning or some general learning work in the factory to make a program that I can put out in the wild so the robot can come to your house and learn to do well. And I think that we can do this subject to constraints of a bunch of different kinds, right? So one thing is we do know stuff from biological intelligence. Um, we know that Human infants, but also probably infants of other mammalian species, are born with actually quite a lot of cognitive structure already in there. Uh, they're disposed to, uh, in some sense, think of the world in terms of objects and their properties, uh, to understand that there are other agents in the world, to understand something about space, maybe, and physics and kinematics. So there's a bunch of stuff there that we can learn from biological systems that we could build into our robots. And again, by building those things in, we might be making a mistake. But I think it's the only, the only way forward in a short amount of time. Uh, there's also things to build in that are derived from invariance in the world. So most of you who have looked at neural networks at all, you know about convolutional neural networks. Convolution is a structure that you can build into your neural network. And it's sensible to build in because of the properties of images. Because nearby pixels in the image field are related to one another in an important way. Because recognizing a chair involves a localized set of pixels in my image, and so on. So there are invariants in the world that we can use to structure the learning that we might do in the factory of how to, how to make an intelligent robot. 
Um, and there's also, I think, things that we might build in just because of the fact that we, the people who are designing the robot factory, are human engineers. And we human engineers are only able to build systems with a certain kind of modularity, at least in the engineering process, because we have limited cognitive capacity. We have to think modularly. Even if possibly the system that we build doesn't have some modularization, we, when we design the thing, have to think that way because we can't think of a whole complicated brain-like program all at once. So this is, this is kind of my strategy. And I mean, the other thing is, is that if you study machine learning theory, you know that uh, only by building in some constraint on the space of hypotheses or the space of answers can you get a system that can learn in like a reasonable amount of time and with a reasonable amount of data. Okay, so I'll tell you a little bit of my history of why I got interested in learning and robots. Um, so when I was, I was a graduate student at this place called SRI, which is a, I don't know, it's kind of like the Draper or Lincoln of Stanford. Um, so I did my PhD there, and I showed up there, and they were building a robot. Nobody really, they, uh, SRI was famous for a previous robot called Shaky. Um, when I got there, Shaky was sitting in a corner leaking hydraulic fluid into a pan. Um, and, there, and all the shaky people were not there anymore. There was a new group of people. They wanted to make a robot. It was going to be a cool robot. It ended up being called Flaky. Uh, that was an homage to shaky. Um, and here was my story. Okay, so I did not know anything. My, oh, my undergraduate degree is in philosophy, by the way. Okay, so uh, I, I knew how to do some programming, and I had an undergraduate degree in philosophy, and I showed up, and there was really nobody there. I didn't know anything about control theory. I didn't really know anything. Okay, so, but here's this robot. I'm supposed to program it to do something. I mean, a, a friend was building it, and I was working on the programming. And so here's how it, it had these sonar sensors. If you took 601 here at MIT, you know about sonar sensors. This robot had the same sonar sensors. Uh, and so, and they're terrible. They give you a really bad signal, and they're trouble to work with, and so on. And so, but I was trying to program the robot to go straight down the hallway using the sonars. Okay, so here's how that worked. What would happen is I would write a program, I put it in the robot, I would run the robot, the robot would run into the wall. I would bring it back and study the log files and see that there was something wrong, and I would fix the program and put it in the robot and run it, and it would run into the wall. Now, new reason, hopefully. I would bring it back, fix the program, robot runs into the wall, I bring it back, I fix the program. Okay, so I did this for several weeks. And as a result, I, me, Leslie, learned how to navigate down the hallway using sonar sensors. And I decided right then that it was, that was a terrible kind of distribution of labor, and the robot should be learning how to navigate down the hall using sonar sensors, not me. So that was that. Uh, this is this this is an artifact that was funny. Well, I'll tell you about it anyway. But it's it, okay. So what is this? This is a slide. So back in the day when you gave a talk, you did it by writing with colored pens on pieces of plastic and you put them on an overhead projector. And I had forgotten completely about this, but I was telling my graduate students that this is how we used to give talks. And I said, man, I might have a talk. Some some of these talks still in my filing cabinet, which I did. So a couple of weeks ago, I gave a talk to my research group. Uh, using ancient, ancient slides written by me with markers. So here's one from 1988. Um, it's interesting for kind of in-joke reasons to the machine learning community, but basically I kind of, with again, yet, yet again, not knowing what I was doing, I reinvented some crazy aspects of reinforcement learning. Well, instead of reward, I called it pleasure, which is kind of more fun. So, okay, so this is me writing a slide about reinforcement learning, so I tried to do reinforcement learning, and in my thesis defense, I had a little robot named Spanky, uh, it, and in my actual defense, it did reinforcement learning, and it learned how to follow the walls of its enclosure. Okay, so this is just to say that all this reinforcement learning stuff is not completely new, and even in 1990, it wasn't new, uh, but okay, so that was good, but then what became clear to me is that just the direct application of reinforcement learning stuff was not going to solve the problems of intelligence, which is what I was interested in then. And I, later on, this is some talk I gave in 95, uh, which summarizes my current position pretty well, which is roughly, right, 
I don't know if you can read this, the romantic ideal of a big pile of circuitry that learns to be an intelligent agent cannot be achieved. That was my view. We have to design an agent with lots of structure and many small circumscribed learning problems. Okay, and, and I still believe that. I still think that this standard end-to-end -end reinforcement learning setup is great for some kinds of stuff. It's great for learning some kinds of motor skills, for stirring, for catching, for throwing, for juggling. Uh, but I don't think it's great for a kind of higher intelligence. So what I spend all my days thinking about is how can we combine some form of built-in structure with the coolest learning algorithms we have, and now we do have cooler learning algorithms. I think the learning algorithms aren't that much different. They're a little bit different, but the, we have a better ways of deploying them. We have bigger computers and more data and so on. So that's what we try to do. Okay. Um, I, I will say something about research strategy, and then I have some technical stuff in here which I'm just going to zip by, and I'll show you some robot movies, and maybe even answer some questions at the end. Okay, so here's what we're trying to do right at the moment in my research group, which is think about designing an architecture for robots where we build in a bunch of stuff. We build in convolution, kinematics, right? So uh, how is it that when I move my joints, my hand moves? Right. I understand kinematics. We all understand kinematics very well. We're just going to build it in. I don't think that there's a reason to learn that. Uh, we know algorithms for doing certain kinds of planning. We know algorithms for doing some kinds of abstraction and hierarchy. So we're going to build those things in. And what we have been doing is, for right now, also hand building sort of the models that these algorithms use. And that we want to get away from. But let me just show you, right? So this is my, my paradigmatic example of a problem. This is not my kitchen. But imagine, imagine that you had to go in that kitchen and like make lunch. OK? Now, OK, so you've grown a little bit. But you could do it. You could totally do it. You could clean up. And then you could make lunch. But it's a hard problem, right? It's not like a really hard problem. And it's hard for some like really interesting reasons. Oh, let me back up, right? So what, what makes it hard? Well, there's a lot of objects in there. So people who do robotics like to talk about degrees of freedom. Like that's like how many joints you have. And they say, oh, my robot is very difficult because there's many degrees of freedom. This problem, if you think about it, you think about what are the degrees of freedom? Well, the degrees of freedom are like not just the robot's degrees of freedom, but the positions and orientations of all the objects. And like whether the grapes are rotten, and what's in the blue bowl, and when are the people coming home, and all these things, right? So the, it's, you, can't even, you, can't, you can't even think about the number of degrees of freedom in that kitchen. So the space, if you think about the space that you have to plan in, it's huge. So that's one thing that makes it hard. Another thing that makes it hard is that the horizon is long. So right when you do planning, when you do reasoning, even if you're doing Atari games or if you're doing this kitchening, kitchen, the problem, generally speaking, gets exponentially harder as a function of how long your plan has to be, how many steps you have to take. So how many steps do you have to take to clean this kitchen? And if you think of a step as like maybe a linear motion of your joints, well, like, like I don't know, hundreds of thousands, really a lot of steps. And the uncertainty is fundamental. So this is not a problem that you can say, oh, I see, my kitchen is in state S, and I need to figure out how to move it to state S sub goal. Because you don't know what state the kitchen's in. right? You don't know what's in the cupboard or under the board or all these things. right? So there's a fundamental uncertainty also about what's going on. So super hard problem. On the one hand, it feels like a super hard problem. On the other hand, I don't know, everybody in this room could do it. Right? Now, not everybody in this room could, could win the Go championship. It's interesting, right? We're super impressed by the fact that a program can like, play at the same level as the best human Go player, because not many of us can do that. So that's like a super weird specialized ability, which happens to be abstracted all the way away from the mess of, of the world and of kitchens and so on. Uh, so, but, but so that's cool, and it's cool that we can do that. But we can't even get near, we can't even get even remotely near this problem. So, you know, you guys should all work on this. Never, never mind games. All right. So we have this kind of like old school block diagram for how to approach this problem. 
And uh, a colleague and I have been basically implementing uh, an instance of that thing. Hand, there's no learning right now, so it's that architecture with hand-built models and stuff. But what it can do is a bunch of different problems pretty robustly. Like, so here's a case where it's supposed to get the green block to the corner of the table. Um, and it realized that it had to get the red one out of the way. The green one's too big to pick up. It also knows that its ability to push things is not very reliable. And so when it pushes something, it looks to see if it got to where it was supposed to go. And if it didn't, it makes a new plan and goes again. The same code, okay, so this is all the same code and this is a very important point. Any given thing that our robot does, any of you could program it to do better. So what's good about this is that it's the same program that does all these things. And we don't tell it what to do. I had a really interesting conversation with some ethicists from the US military, actually, who wanted to talk to me about autonomous weapons. That was kind of interesting. The first question was, has your robot ever done something you didn't expect? And I was like, oh, what do you mean has it ever done? I mean, the question is, has it ever done anything I did expect, right? Never. And what I realized was that their model of how you would program a robot was that you was the Lego Mindstorms model of how you would program a robot, which is that basically you say, move forward a meter, turn left, take a picture, see if it has a dog in it, turn right, do the thing, whatever. Like you would give it instructions. The fact that the way every single person who programs an AI system now programs it is by specifying, in some sense, a space of solutions and an objective function and some kind of an optimization algorithm. Like, that was totally mind-blowing to them. They were educated, smart people who were doing a good job of their job. But they had no idea about what we do as, like, builders of AI systems. So I think there's an important little PR message that, that we have to do. OK, anyway, so good. So there's this thing that we built by hand, but we would like it to learn instead. And so what uh, lately we've been working on the last couple of years with graduate students is finding ways to do learning. And I have like, let's see, five minutes. So I'm just going to like, I'm going to play these slides as if they were a movie and show you an example. OK, good. So you don't care about this. I'm sorry, I, I wasn't. Um, so we're doing neural network stuff. So we're slot like a little bit cool. But we're learning rules that kind of they're a little bit like old school AI rules, but we're using neural networks to learn them. We're learning, so one thing that we're doing right now is trying to think about uh, lots and lots of people in robot learning right now are trying to learn motor skills. So they're trying to learn how to pour, let's say, or how to walk, or how to open a door, or how to clean a table. So lots of people are working on those individual skills. And that's good, and it's important. That's not what we're working on. We're now worried about the problem of how would you put these skills together in order to actually like work on that kitchen or make lunch, right? So you need a bunch of little skills, that's true, but you also need a kind of an understanding of what they're good for and when and how and how to put them together to do a job. So that's the thing that we're working on. And so uh, you can describe for the purposes of a, of a planning algorithm, you can describe an operation at an abstract level. So we might say, OK, uh, I have this skill, which is to pour. And maybe my pouring skill has a gain, right? There's some kind of parameter in the, in the primitive. Uh, and I would, I would like to use it to cause liquid to be in some destination container. But what I have to tell my planning algorithm is, under what circumstances is it true that if I run my pouring program, it will have this result. Right? So I can learn pouring, but I want to know, well, how, where does the thing I'm pouring from and into, what relationship do they have to have spatially? Uh, does it depend on the viscosity of the fluid? Does it depend on the gain that I pass into the pouring program, and so on? So what we're trying to learn here is a, is a constraint, a relationship among all these different variables that says, if this constraint on all these variables is true, and I call the pouring program, then with high probability, stuff will end up in the cup. So that's the learning problem that we've been working on. And there's a bunch of interesting technical stuff about that, which I'm going to skip now. Maybe. 
with my little advancer will advance. PowerPoint being the thing it is, not so good for making slideshows, I guess. Okay, sorry. I should have edited this all out. Okay. Oh wait, let me say something about research methodology. Uh, uh, no, let me not, okay. Okay, good. So in the end, here's a simple demo in two dimensions, and then I'll show you something with an actual robot. Simple demonstration in two dimensions. So here's a case where we said, we would like to make a cup of coffee. And what it means to make a, a cup of coffee is to, in the cup, have coffee and cream and sugar and have it be stirred and have it be sitting on this little green coaster and have it pushed out to the end of the table. So that's a longish plan. It's like not cleaning that kitchen, but like it's something. And what we did was we learned operations of pushing and scooping and pouring, and we learned the conditions under which they would work. And so now we can call, we can put all that stuff in a planning algorithm with the, that already knows how to do some basic operations, and it can plan to make a cup of coffee. And what we're showing here is that there are different initial conditions. So the, the cups and the sugar bin and stuff have different sizes. And the, the algorithm can, and there's continuous parameters, right? So this is planning in, in actual continuous space. And this algorithm can make plans and execute them to do all these different things. OK, so that's sort of good. So what do we do over the summer? Over the summer, um, we got several Europs and a couple graduate students, and we worked together to try to now do this on the robot. So this robot already knew how to pick up and put down objects, but we learned uh, pouring and pushing, and we learned the pre-images. We learned those rules that it uses so that it could put into the planner. And so now what we can do is give the robot a variety of goals it's using like real perception so that its input is not so good. We can give it a variety of goals and a variety of initial arrangements of objects. We just put that stuff on the table any old way and it can achieve the goals. And so what's important about this is the variability in the domain. What's important about this is that the, the, it's, a, it's, it's a pretty long horizon. It has to make choices about which objects to move out of the way so that things will be accessible. So it's not completely stupid. It's also not completely reliable, but that's like life in the robot lane. Um, but you can put all the stuff down on the table and say, hey, robot, pour stuff into this bowl. There it scooted the bowl into its workspace so that it would be accessible for pouring. We never told it to do that. It just knows that the bowl has to be in some relation to the cup that it's pouring from in order for the pouring to work. And then it reasons, it says, oh, I need the bowl and the cup to be in some relation. So how am I gonna make that happen? Well, I think I'm gonna have to move the bowl and I think I'm gonna have to pick the cup up, up in a certain way so that I can do these things. But it's very general. It could do things with either hand, it could do things on different tables. So uh, it, it's a little contorted sometimes, but we're, we're kind of happy about this. All right, so I've been half an hour, so I'm just gonna cut to the end and then. So there's another cool thing, but we have no time for such nonsense. Okay. Um. Oh yeah, and our curves are better than their curves. Good. Uh, that's you always have that. You have to end the talk that way. So let me get back to this. Uh, shoot. So okay. So this is this is also a picture from one of my ancient talks, and I, I still kind of buy it, right? So uh, and this is meant to be a picture of like kind of different levels of intelligent behavior and different levels of abstraction, and an idea that we need to develop different kinds of reasoning and learning techniques to operate at these different levels of abstraction. So at the lowest level, we might have simple kind of parameter tuning in, in servo loops, say. At the next level, maybe model-based, model-free reinforcement learning, things like deep Q networks or something like that, or DDPG or whatever, to learn basic skills. What I'm focusing on here is roughly what I would call routine activity, right? How is it that you just do the business that you do all the time, hardly thinking about it? Uh, how do you chain together operations and make sure that they work, make sure they're robust when your perception's not reliable? At a higher level, there's you know maybe simple kinds of problem solving, things like doing your errands in a good sequence or planning a trip. And then at the very top, there's this you know playing go stuff, or maybe philosophy. I don't know which is harder. Uh, you, you, you can think about that. Anyway, so I do this work with a bunch of people, with colleagues, with graduate students, with uh, year ups. Uh, students all teach me stuff, and um, I will just play the robot a slight 
a bit of a blooper reel of the robot. And I would be happy to answer questions if we have time for doing that. But I don't know. The bosses have to say that. Anyway, I'm done. Thank you. <laughs>